Good evening. Welcome to our evening service. We're going to do something different tonight. We're not going to be in Psalms tonight. Um, we have a different task. I have a different task tonight, and you have a different task. Your task will be different, uh, somewhat. So one of the things that we want to put on the website is uh, a series of 15 or 20 minute messages um, for the community. Because a lot of people, when they look and see an hour, they may not click on that, but they might click on 15 or 20 minutes. So that's the strategy. These will be outreach messages, basic Christianity messages designed to reach non-Christians. You say, well, why don't you just do that by yourself? I need feedback from people. So it's when you teach, you do better if people are there. Your job tonight is to be there, listen, feedback. As I teach something you already know, uh, we're not going to do this every Sunday night. Once in a while, we'll do it. So I'm going to have two messages tonight, <clears throat> Lord willing. Uh, and uh, for the internet ministry, your job is to be here and help me pray pray for this these as we give them that God would give me grace and he would speak to people uh, uh, through them, if you would. And so that's what we're going to do. That's the assignment. And then we'll be back in Psalms next week. But uh, we're trying to do this. And maybe once every month or two, we'll try to do another one of these. And we'll see how it works, see what kind of response we get. Uh, Troy is gearing up the internet ministry in different ways and so we're trying different things. So uh, tonight we're going to uh, look at the subject of God's grace and there's many ways to teach this but I'd like to introduce it tonight briefly just with this thought from John chapter 4 a very famous section in the Bible. And the Lord Jesus meets a lady at the well in Samaria. And what wonderful event as God's grace reaches out to this woman. She had nothing going for her. Nothing. And yet the Lord reached out to her uh, in a wonderful way. In a way that surprised her. Surprises the disciples. Uh, surprised everybody who read about it that he would even do that. And that's what grace does. God's grace, if it wasn't for God's grace, we would have no hope. We would never be in any place any better than this woman. Now in John chapter 4, uh, in verses 5 to 14, we have God's grace winsomely presented. Those of us that teach the doctrine of grace should be gracious. And what an awful thing it is if those of us that are preaching grace do not display grace as we minister to others. And so as we look at this, one of the first things we see is God's grace winsomely presented. Our role as Christians is to proclaim the gospel of grace and proclaim it in all its beauty and glory and its fullness. But even as we do that, we should do it winsomely. And that's what Jesus did. Let's watch in John 4, 5 to 14, God's grace winsomely presented. This is how we Christians should be doing it, although we do not always achieve that. There, in verse 5, it says, Then comes he, that's Jesus, to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and it's still there. My sister's been to that well. I haven't, but she has been to that well. It's still there. Now Jacob's well was there, uh, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. 
for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy food. Then says the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask to drink of me, you are a woman of Samaria? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And that's exactly true. She was dead right on that. And there are many people that write off other people. I don't talk to those kind of people. I don't minister to those kind of people. And, but Jesus was not of that opinion. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he'd given you living water. Now God's grace is a gift we don't deserve. That's exactly what it is. By grace are we saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast, the Apostle Paul said. And here uh, we see in John, Jesus speaking about a gift that he wants to give. The Apostle Paul said in Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From where then have you this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it, from it himself and his sons and daughters? The Samaritans and the Jews shared Jacob, the patriarch, in their religious background. And Jesus answered and said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So here is God's grace winsomely presented. He's got this woman's attention now, doesn't he? Not just because of what he said, but of who he is, and how he acts towards her. We are not all gracious who preach the doctrine of grace, but we should be. And the Lord Jesus certainly was. He exhibited grace. He did not sledgehammer people uh, as some preachers do. He exhibited grace. And uh, she started out defiantly, but he did not. And what a wonderful thing. Mark Twain said something. He spoke about people who, Mark Twain was not a Christian. His wife was a wonderful Christian, but he was not. And he spoke about people who were good in the worst sense of the word. It's a horrible thing, isn't it? What kind of picture does that bring to your mind? People who are good in the worst sense of of the word. But Mark Twain's wife was not that. Her last words to him when she was dying, she says, I only have one regret, and I don't remember how she said it, but she, her only regret was that he had never become a Christian. I heard the guide in Mark Twain's home in Hartford, Connecticut, tell that story. It was rather marvelous. And, but there are people who are good in the worst sense of that, that term, that word. But Jesus was not that kind of person. There's an aroma of grace about him and there should be an aroma of grace about us who proclaim the doctrine of grace. So God's grace, uh, graciously presented, uh, winsomely presented, and then in 15 to 25, we see God's grace grievously needed. Now, we all need grace. There's no one that's going to be saved apart from God's grace. But this woman illustrates the need of grace that we all have. We may never engage in the kind of things she engaged in, but we need. it takes just as much grace to get us to heaven as it does her as it did her. But anyway, we see God's grace grievously needed in this woman 
uh, said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, You well said you have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you got now is not your husband. You're on number six. <laughs> what a sad, pitiful life that describes, right? Describes many people's life, and it described hers. And Jesus knew all the pain in that woman's life. Some caused by different husbands and maybe some caused by herself. She needed grace. And Jesus said, That say, sayest thou truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. There's something different about you. You know my life and you've never met me. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain and you say in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship she, you mean the Jewish people. And Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you will neither worship in this mountain nor at Jerusalem will worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth truth and the woman said to him I know when Messiah comes who's called Christ when he comes he'll tell us all things and Jesus said I that speak to thee am he God's grace grievously needed this woman needed to hear grace didn't she with all the pain in her life and all the no doubt sin in her life and she's not the only one that needs God's grace every person on this planet needs God's grace Judy Garland in the movie Wizard of Oz sang about being over the rainbow. But grace is living under the rainbow of God's grace. That rainbow first appeared after Noah's flood and the sunshine of God's love refracting off the dewdrops of his inflexible righteousness is what presents grace uh, and makes it what it is. So what a wonderful thing. Apart from the cross, there could be no grace. But because Jesus died for your sins and mine, and we certainly need it, there can be grace. Now, in verse 26 to 30, we have God's grace powerfully experienced. This woman experienced it. This is what changed her life. By the way, this is what changed my life. Not perfectly, I'm not sinless. In your life, it's God's grace powerfully experienced. And Jesus said something to her. He didn't say to everybody, but he said it to her openly. I that speak to thee am he. I am the Messiah. When people find out who Jesus is, and they find out who they are, at the same time, that he knows all about them, and he knows the good, bad, and the ugly, and they, they see something about his graciousness and his goodness, there is something that's beautiful and great. And great. So uh, she experiences God's grace just as our Lord revealed himself to her, one-on-one. -on -one. Isn't that what happened to you when you got saved, if you're a Christian? And this, isn't that what can happen to others that are listening to my voice? Where they hear the Lord Jesus, I that speak to you am he. I am the one. And upon this, his disciples came and marveled. He talked with the woman. I marvel that Jesus has anything to say to me, but he does. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot. She doesn't care. Her original mission is not in her mind. It's the farthest thing from her mind. She came to get water. She left to get people. She, if we experience God's grace, we want others to experience what we've experienced. And that's all we Christians are. We don't think we're better than other people. We know we may be worse than other people, but we've experienced God's grace and we want them to have what we have. So she left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? 
Notice she didn't talk to the women. They weren't talking to her. But she went to the people who would talk to her. And who no doubt knew her past. Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meanwhile, his disciples besought him, saying, Master, eat. He said, I have food to eat that you don't know of. And every Christian can say that, right? There's joy in serving Jesus. And Jesus had joy in doing the will of the Father. Therefore said the disciples, has any man brought him anything to eat? He said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white to harvest. And he that reaps and receives wages and gathers fruit and eternal life, both he that sows and he that reaps may re rejoice together. And there is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap on that which you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you entered into his labor. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him, for the saying of the woman who testified, he told me everything I ever did. You know, we can experience that, right? Because God's grace is powerfully experienced when we open the scriptures. And the Bible tells us everything we ever did. When we read the Bible, it reads us. And that's what happened to this woman. So I hope that... Uh, this little message and these thoughts are a challenge to anyone that's listening to this. And the experience of grace, experiencing God's grace, uh, uh, is something that moves on not just to salvation, but to worship. It changes all of life. They have the worship wars in the first century between the Samaritans and the Jews. And we have uh, differences of opinion now. But Jesus punched all the way through all of that. This woman's biggest problem wasn't her failed marriages or failed relationships. It was her faulty religion. It was half right and half wrong. And they were right on many things and they were wrong on other things. She hadn't found the right man, but she certainly hadn't found the right religion. But now she experiences God's grace. And what a wonderful thing it is for her and for everybody else that ever knew her. And now she learns about worship, that worship needs to be in spirit and in truth. Nobody who truly worships if they don't understand grace. And what a precious thing. God says, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews. The Lord's grace does not deny all the truth that came before in the Old Testament. It simply fulfills those things. Richard Sibbs, an old writer a few hundred years ago, said, Outward worship without inward is but the carcass of worship. And what we have here is an inward thing bursting out, worshiping in spirit and in truth. Somebody said, as a thoughtful gift is a celebration of a birthday, as a special evening out is a celebration of an anniversary, as a warm eulogy is a celebration of a life, as a sexual embrace is a celebration of a marriage, so worship is a celebration of God. And worship is simply celebrating God for his grace. What a wonderful thing that is. So I hope that this is helpful and I hope this is a challenge for anyone that hears this. Hope you can learn to worship in spirit and in truth by admitting your sin and trusting in Christ and letting him expose you to yourself and learn about his grace. Father, we thank you for each one that hears this message. We pray that they might know the riches of your grace, as the Apostle Paul puts it. That they might know salvation that's by grace. That they might know how to grow in grace. That they might know and look forward to the grace that's to come when Jesus comes, as Peter puts it. 
they might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord. And Father, do that work that only grace can do. In Jesus' name.